This presentation on innovative daylighting strategies for airports was prepared by professors Wayne Place and Jensen Hu of North Carolina State University and delivered by Wayne Place at the symposium, Aerial Futures, Grounded Visions, Shaping the Airport Terminal of Tomorrow, which was held in conjunction with the Fentress Architects exhibit of their design work at the Venice Architectural Biennale. The symposium was sponsored by Fentress Architects, hosted by the European Cultural Center, and organized by Plain Sight. Airport buildings typically have large expanses of roof that represent a significant opportunity for admitting natural light to illuminate the building interior. For daylighting purposes, roofs have significant advantages compared to walls. They face the entire sky vault so that they can harvest the light from the parts of the sky that support the illumination design goals of the space. The glazing can be located in size to achieve a range of illuminance goals for the interior spaces. For example, we might have a design in mind where we want very spatially very uniform illumina illuminance in which case the roof apertures would be consistent in size and uniformly distributed throughout the roof. Or we might want illumination that is spatially highly variable. For example, in some spaces we might want low steady illuminance levels to give good visibility for electronic display screens or where vendors want to use electric light to highlight their products. In other spaces, we might want more stimulating and more variable light. For example, in the holding areas, we might appreciate beam sunlight very early in the morning when we're trying to set our neurological clocks and late in the day when we can be treated to a beautiful sunset. The simplest daylighting design that we can imagine is to cut a hole in a roof. If the roof is generally flat, then the resulting aperture in the opaque envelope is horizontal. We may form the glazing into a domical or pyramidal, pyramidal shape to shed water or provide structural depths. However, from the light and energy accepting points of view, it is a horizontal opening in the opaque envelope. In this simple diagrammatic image, the building is represented with four vertical walls and a roof that is entirely glazed. However, keep in mind that this is diagrammatic. At the moment, we are focusing on the glazing orientation and we are not saying anything about the area of the aperture. It could be anywhere between 1% and 100% of the roof area. Such an aperture faces the entire sky vault. As such, it is very efficient in terms of the amount of light it can collect per unit area of glazing. This is the major motive for wanting to use a horizontal aperture. The solar diagram in this image is for 36 degrees north latitude. The red needles represent the sun angles on the aperture at the summer solstice at June 21st. The green needles represent the sun angles on the aperture at the winter solstice which is a December 21st. You will note that there are more red needles and green needles reflecting the longer days at the summer solstice. Compared to the green needles, the angles of incidence for the red needles are more favorable for penetration of the light through the aperture. Combining these two factors, the collection of light and heat through the aperture, will be much greater in the month of June than in the month of December. For example, in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is very close to 36 degrees north latitude, the collection of light and heat will be three times, three times greater in June than in December. This is the exact opposite of what we desire, both thermally and psychologically. Thermally, we don't want a daylighting configuration that makes the building hotter in summer and colder in winter. And psychologically, we do not want more light and warmth in the hot months of the year. Beam sunlight admitted through the aperture can hit occupants in the eye and cause extreme visual discomfort. 
That glare can be substantially diminished by introducing diffusing materials, such as diffusing glazing in the aperture. However, that glazing can still be intensely luminous and can cause significant glare. The transmissivity of the diffusing glazing can be set by the manufacturer to get the illuminance roughly in the range that is desired. However, this does not solve the problem of rapid fluctuations in the level of beam sunlight. For example, if the transmissivity is set so that we have the right amount of interior illuminance when there is a cloud over the sun, when the cloud moves away, the thermal load from solar gain will go up by roughly a factor of seven or eight, causing thermal discomfort for the occupants and drastically increasing the cooling load of the building. When another cloud passes over the sun, the illuminance level will drop dramatically. At that point, the interior luminance level may still be at or above the level prescribed by code, but occupants of the building will experience dissatisfaction with the new lower luminance level because their eyes were adapted to the much brighter luminance level that they experienced just a few seconds before. Often the response of the occupants will be to turn on the electric lights, thereby negating all of the energy benefits that were to be derived from the daylighting system. Mechanized shades and louvers have been tried as a means of regulating the flow of light and energy into the building. These have to be rapidly responsive in order to accommodate the rapid changes in beam sunlight. I once visited a newly commissioned library in which there was a large skylight protected by mechanized rotating louvers mounted directly above the skylight. On a partly cloudy day, with clouds coming and going, the louvers were constantly moving to compensate for the rapid change in beam sunlight. The whining sound from the mechanism drove the patrons and the staff of the library crazy. Not long after the building was occupied, the louver mechanism was decommissioned and the electric lights were turned on, thereby losing all the intended lighting electricity reductions. The resulting building was substantially less energy efficient than it would have been with a simple insulated roof, since the heat continued to be lost through the glazing, even though the daylighting system had been deactivated. Electrochromic glass has also been proposed as a means to regulate the flow of light and energy. Unfortunately, even after 40 years of research, electrochromic glazing still requires five to 10 minutes to transition. Since a cloud can obscure the sun in a few seconds, waiting for five to 10 minutes gets the illuminance back, to get the illuminance back up to an acceptable level is not satisfactory. In short, we currently have no reliable methods to compensate for the extreme rapid variations in the daylighting resource. Rather than horizontal glazing, we might want to consider other slopes and orientations for the aperture. For example, in this image, the solar needles are shown on a vertical east-facing aperture. This diagram is configured like it is the wall of a building, but in the roof it would be shaped more like a sawtooth with an opaque surface sloping towards the west and the vertical glazing facing east. This aperture has all the same problems as a horizontal aperture in terms of collecting substantially more light and heat in summer than winter, extreme potential glare from beam sunlight, and rapid variability of the resource, which can cause adaptation problems for the occupants. In addition, uh, compared to horizontal glazing, it is vertical so that it only harvests light from half of the sky vault. Therefore, it will have to have about twice the area of the horizontal glazing aperture to collect the desired amount of light. This increases initial costs and also heat loss during the cold months of the year. 
West-facing apertures have all the same problems associated with east-facing apertures, and in addition, the thermal loads for the west-facing apertures come in the afternoon when peak utility loads tend to occur, and people are already suffering from the extreme heat. A tilted aperture facing north is the worst possible configuration, having all the problems of a horizontal aperture and more, including eliminating all the brightness and the warmth of the winter sun. So you'll notice here all these green arrows are basically just hitting the opaque portions of the roof and the glazing, which is occurring on the tilted north facing side, receives no beam sunlight during the winter time. This north-facing tilted aperture is also exposed to intense beam sunlight during the summer time from the moment the sun comes up in the morning until the moment it sets at night. So you'll notice here the very first rays of light that come up in the morning are already incident on that, which makes it even worse in that sense than a horizontal aperture where those rays are just grazing across the top of the aperture. This orientation accepts more than seven times as much light and heat in the month of June as in the month of December. This again would be for Raleigh weather conditions. So we talked about a lot of aperture orientations that are really bad. Um, let's talk about one that works fairly well, which is south facing glazing. South-facing apertures give a better seasonal balance than any of the others we just talked about, receiving more light and heat in December than in the month of June. There is less beam sunlight on a summer day, and the beam sunlight that is incident on the aperture can be blocked by a modest overhang, as shown in the next diagram. So here you see the beam sunlight around midday at midsummer is now being blocked by this overhang. Among the disadvantages of this configuration are the overhang causes the aperture to harvest light from less than half of the sky vault. So we've gone from the full sky vault for horizontal glazing to half a sky vault for vertical glazing and now less than half of a sky vault for vertical glazing with an overhang. Second thing is the diffusing elements will need to be uh, incorporated to intercept the beam sunlight and distribute the sunlight around the space. In other words, this is a system with a lot of potential glare, particularly during the winter time when all of this beam sunlight is incident on that aperture in a way where there will be massive penetration of that light. And we love that from a thermal point of view um, and, a, and a psychological point of view during the winter time, but we don't like it from a glare point of view. So I'd like to talk about north-facing glazing. Unfortunately, I don't have an image of the solar needles on a north-facing aperture, but we can visualize it fairly easily by starting with this the south-facing aperture shown here. So here we have south-facing glazing, and in your mind, I want you to just mirror the opaque parts of this building over to the other side. So the opaque portion of the building is going to be here. And the glazing is going to be facing towards the north. So all these needles of light in the morning and the late afternoon that would be blocked for the south facing are now incident on that north facing aperture. And all of these needles and all of these needles are then blocked by the south-facing opaque surfaces of the building. So the only beam sunlight that north-facing glazing is getting this early morning light uh, around the summer, midsummer. Um, keep in mind that that light is incident at a fairly shallow angle, so there's not a huge amount of penetration. So almost all the beam sunlight is eliminated during the summer months except this beam sunlight early in the morning and late in the day uh, around midsummer. Um, that beam sunlight is coming at a time of day where people might welcome it uh, even though it is midsummer. Um, if you're there at 5 a.m. in the morning when the sun comes up, it probably helps wake you up and make you feel good. And if you're there in late in the evening, 
you can enjoy the sunsets that are associated with that. So, in summary, north and south are the preferred aperture orientations. Uh, they work well if all the glass is facing north, um, or all the glass facing south, or the combination of north and south. And by north and south, by the way, I want to emphasize we don't mean sort of north or sort of south. We mean precisely solar north and precisely solar south. To illustrate this point, there was an art museum built in a city with a strong street grid. So here you see uh, in this magenta color, the street grid. Here you see solar north. Um, there was a direction designated as north. So that's this direction right here on the street grid. In reality, street grid north was about 40 degrees east of solar north. The building designers were apparently unaware of this fact. When the building got occupied, the curators were horrified to discover that there was a huge amount of beam sunlight bleaching their paintings. This is an example of the need to get it right. In formulating a daylighting design, do not be careless. Stick to the principles and get it right. This is a philosophical point for me of incredible importance. Really creative people are not lazy. They embrace the complexity of a design challenge and work at it really hard. As an example, Gothic cathedrals represent a very high level of both artistic and technical achievement. What makes them amazing and wonderful is how incredibly demanding the design challenge was with apparently contradictory design criteria. On the one hand, they wanted to use a very heavy structural material with no tensile capacity, which is already hugely challenging. And then second of all, they wanted to admit as much light as possible and make the structure seem as transparent as possible. They struggled for centuries with this deeply challenging and unforgiving design contradiction. I think that solar is like this. If we are ever going to get it right, we have to work at getting it right. If we want good diffuse north light, and we want to avoid undesirable beam sunlight, then we need to face the aperture directly towards solar north. If we want good solar heating benefits during the winter time and to avoid unwanted summer sun that will run up the cooling energy costs, we want to face the aperture absolutely directly south. If you get significantly off of directly south, you're going to start getting summer east light and summer west light that are going to run up your cooling load bills. This sawtooth roof would be an example of a north-facing aperture. The system is simple and inexpensive, lacking any significant overhangs over the glazing and any elements to diffuse beam sunlight because there's almost no beam sunlight there and it tends to be there at a time when the building is either not occupied or when people will find that beam sunlight cheerful anyway. The south-facing sloping roof, this right here, is the perfect orientation for solar cells. This design is an aggressive and very effective approach to harvesting all of the solar energy using power-dense beam sunlight to generate electric power and the diffuse northern skylight for mellow, well-behaved illumination. South-facing sawtooth roofs can work well also. However, they are more complicated and expensive than north-facing sawtooths, and that south-facing sawtooths require overhangs, which you see right here, to protect the glazing from unwanted summer sun. They also should have banners to diffuse the light and reduce glare. So here we have, by the way, midwinter 
midday sun at this angle, penetrating the aperture very effectively around equinox. The sun angles are such that this overhang is starting to be effective in reducing that amount of light. And then we haven't even shown the summer sun because we set this overhang to very effectively exclude all of the beam sunlight during the summertime. So our challenges become at midwinter, we need some element that uh, sits about right here. This element, by the way, should be about half transmissive and half reflective so that the light gets scattered around the, the space. And also so the banner itself is never uh, excessively luminous uh, for any particular angle that you might be viewing it. Uh, around equinox, the banner uh, drops from this high position down to this lower position. But there's not a great deal of movement and it doesn't have to, have to happen on a minute to minute basis or an hour to hour. It's more like a month to month basis. And during the fall, it might have to be moved uh, three or four times and then in the spring also. Uh, those adjustments can be made with a simple manual control. <clears throat> with this south facing system though, there are still adaptation issues having to do with rapid changes in light from the south, which may prompt some users to turn the electric lights on to even out the luminous variations over time. So one of the systems I like is actually the mixture of north and south. Um, the north glazing provides a reliable baseline of illumination, and the south provides some winter warmth and some bright winter light to warm up the occupants. So here we have a, a building with a low roof, high roof, low roof, high roof, and so forth. Uh, there's truss structure holding it up. This truss structure is sparse enough that daylight can be emitted, in this case on the south side, and then on this side facing north. It's a very good combination because it's uniform enough that people are not tempted to turn on the electric lights, but it's variable enough to uh, be enchanting and wonderful and delightful, which is what a daylighting system should be. This image shows section drawings through such a roof <clears throat> uh, with monitors with apertures facing north and south. In this case, deep structurally efficient trusses run from the lower ceiling to the upper ceiling. Because they're so deep, they are be going to be very efficient structurally. The webs of these trusses can be made very delicate and they will interfere minimally with the acceptance of daylight through these north and south apertures. However, these webs members do have a significant structural function because they are supporting the lower roof level uh, off of the trusses so they will probably not be simple rods or angles, but might be square steel tubes. But we have sized these and we know that they're not going to interfere in any significant way with the transmission of the daylight for illuminating the building interior. <clears throat> Up to this point, <clears throat> I have been showing sawtooth roofs with the classic jagged angular visual quality. However, these kinds of roof aperture systems can have fluid curves that produce a very pleasing aesthetic as shown in this image. And one advantage, which you may not be able to detect because this is really not a daylight shot uh, or daytime shot, but curving this roof up rather than coming down too abruptly avoids a hot spot from the, from the sunlight and also dishing it out right here uh, accommodates more effectively uh, handling getting water off the roof without its running up against the glazing. So far we've been talking about north facing and south facing apertures. However, for many airports the existing infrastructure will not allow us to orient the primary facades of the terminal building or the concourse building to the preferred solar orientation. So for example at this airport there's an existing runway that's going in this direction. And by the way, <clears throat> it's a three feet deep of high strength concrete, which is super reinforced with steel and it's 8,000 feet long. So we don't typically mess with these once they're installed. They're not casually moved around. Uh, here we have a taxiway, an apron, 
Um, over here we have an existing roadway that services this airport and then a huge parking deck, which is the centerpiece of this airport. So we have a huge amount of infrastructure and the space that we have to build is enough room for a terminal building here, um, a security zone right here, and the concourse building along here. So this concourse building, by the way, extends way beyond the boundaries of this image. So it's not like we have any choice in terms of swinging that concourse building around to give us the proper solar directions. We're going to have facade issues with this building anyway from a point of view of glare and solar gains, but we can tone down our uh, reliance on those uh, walls, those primary facades, by introducing a, a roof aperture system. So here we've just shown some lines that might represent uh, a glazing direction, which might be north or south, or the combination of those two. Um, so if this is north facing, this direction is north and the line is running east and west, or this could be also south facing. So let's talk about how we might do that in an actual building. This shows a representative portion of the long concourse building showing the long facades, and in this case, the uh, solar north arrow. So north is down this way. And this facade is facing northwest. So not shown in this diagram are some solar panels, which would rest on this portion of the roof right here, which has a very favorable south facing slope to improve the collection of beam sunlight and the generation of electricity. Now in this, by the way, we stop the facade. So here we have a north facing facade, which we just cut off fairly abruptly here. And that's not too bad because the space is probably going to be illuminated uh, from the facade, but if we want to further tone down our reliance on the facades, we can illuminate this little triangle of floor area uh, by continuing this aperture and just tapering it down to zero. So that might look like this. So again, these are north facing apertures. They start off at zero here because there's not much need for that light. And then the deeper we want the light to penetrate, the taller we make the aperture. And now we've arrived at just a uniform vertical height of this glazing, which is going to illuminate primarily uh, this zone of the building. Um, <clears throat> this may still look a little clunky. And if we want to do something that's really artistic and graceful, we can do something like the following. You'll notice that these elements, those two, they're both uh, flat, but they could be curved and they could just um, conform to a single curved element. So that might look something like this. So we've removed the straight segments on the top edge of the aperture with a curved top edge. And then we've also added a curved bottom edge right down here. And we did that to allow positive water flow off of all portions of the roof. Now, we can also start to eliminate parts of the building that don't have the preferred orientation. For example, if this is representative of a zone where a plane would be parked, and that's another representative zone of the building, this corner right here might be a bit superfluous and it has unwanted solar orientations anyway, so we might just choose to eliminate that at the end of the building. And we've eliminated it here, where we now have a north-facing facade, and over on this end of the building, where we have south-facing facade. Now, we can even carry this whole idea further. Like right here, we've got all these unwanted solar orientations, like northwest and southeast and so forth. Uh, we could carve back the facades so that we have only north, south, east, and west facades. So, for example, here we have north and north, and this would be east, and that would be west, and over here we'd have some south facade. And we have pretty good ideas for how to control each one of those uh, solar orientations in terms of how we would use louvers and other uh, control elements to deal with that. The challenge, of course, is that when you make a decision to serrate this facade, you have to think carefully 
about uh, the modularity of your facade and how that works with the modularity of planes that might get parked there. So we've talked about north facing roof apertures. We can also run roof monitors with north and south apertures diagonally across the building. Uh, we have carefully studied the aperture combination in north and south and find that it is excellent in terms of occupant needs, both thermal and psychological, and that it does save energy compared to a building with a simple, flat, insulated roof. However, it does require a large expanse of glazing, roughly 20% of the floor area being illuminated, which costs a fair amount of money and loses more heat than we would like during the cold season because the conductivity of glazing tends to be higher than the conductivity of opaque portions of the roof, and we have a fairly high area of glazing. This, this configuration also has a substantial curb area, and that contributes to the heat loss. So we would still like to do better from the energy and first cost points of view, which brings us back longingly to horizontal apertures, which is we've said can collect area, we can, can collect light from the entire sky vault. So the area of the glazing is reduced if we can go to horizontal and the area of the opaque envelope in the form of curbs can be reduced. The huge problem with horizontal apertures is beam sunlight penetrating during the cooling season. Beam sunlight can be a problem all year long from a glare point of view, but from a thermal and an energy point of view, it's hugely challenging during the cooling season. What we need is a magic glazing material that can accept the diffuse light from the sky and reject the beam sunlight. If we can do that, we no longer have the need for any kind of rapid aperture control. This, this material doesn't move from second to second or minute to minute. It just works. We now have a prototype of what that glazing might be, for which we have preliminary experimental results. On the left is an illuminance meter inside a box. So here we have one photograph of this um, experimental apparatus. And here we have the wall all around, and we have our illuminance meter here, uh, or a sensor there inside the box. You can think of that box as a bay of the building. The height of the walls has been set to approximately the proportions of a space in an airport concourse building. Um, this is a very approximate assumption that we would have to examine carefully in the context of a real design problem. However, to first order, this experimental arrangement puts us in the ballpark of the correct proportions. The sensor is reading the illuminance at about the floor level in the space, or slightly above, which is where we're concerned about. On the right is the same experimental assembly with a sample of the prototype glazing over the box in the sensor. Illuminance measurements were recorded with and without the glazing and with and without a shading element positioned several feet above the box which we use to represent the effect of a cloud blocking the sun from reaching the apparatus. With no shading element, the measurements gave the illuminance under the combination of beam sunlight plus diffuse skylight. With the shading elements, the measurements gave the illuminance under just diffuse skylight. So here are the results. <clears throat> here we have the exposed sensor and three issues, the illuminance under beam sunlight plus diffuse skylight, and then breaking it down by diffuse skylight and beam sunlight. So this is what we were measuring on the sensor, the illuminance near the floor level with no glazing over it. So this is the exposed sensor. This is with the glazing. And these are the same measurements again uh, just repeated. So we got 104 
thousand for the total. Then we put the shading element up and we measured the diffuse skylight only. And then we took the difference between that and that to get the beam component. Then we did that same operation. We measured the total illuminance. Then we put up the shading element. So we were just looking at the sky component. And then we took the difference of that number and that number, which gave us the beam sunlight only. What I want you to notice is the transmissivity, which is the ratio of say this number to that number is 46%. The ratio of this number, excuse me, the ratio of that number to that is 46%. Okay, excuse me a moment, I need to back up here. We're taking the ratio of this number, which is the diffuse skylight after it has managed to get through the glazing, to this number, which was the diffuse skylight that was incident basically on the apparatus. When we take that ratio, we see that the transmissivity for diffuse skylight getting through this glazing system is 46%. That's the ratio of this diffuse skylight number to that one. This number right here is the ratio of the beam sunlight that's getting through this glazing system to the beam sunlight that's incident on the apparatus. It turns out to be slightly less than 2%. So the transmissivity to diffuse skylight is roughly 46% and the transmittance for beam sunlight is slightly under 2%. This is a profound result because it says we have been over 98% effective in blocking the beam sunlight, which during the summertime is the cause of our glare and the cause of our thermal overload. And its extreme variability just creates enormous challenges for us. And to first order, we'd just be happy to get rid of it because the diffuse skylight is more than adequate as a resource and it's very steady and reliable. So we have the magic glazing. The main drawback to this prototype system is that it is not truly static. It must track the sun by rotating in the plane of the glazing. It has to make one full turn per 24 hour period with the same angular speed as the hour hand on a clock. Such a mechanism would be very slow, simple, quiet, durable, and inexpensive, but it's absolutely crucial to the operation of the system. Now, here's where it gets interesting to a designer who thinks about building form. The fact that it must rotate implies that the glazing aperture is circular. This has a potentially huge impact on architectural form, which is limiting and challenging, but very exciting. Not unlike the challenges that were associated in creating the Gothic cathedrals. Now let's talk about sizing these apertures, given the data we were just given. We can't just have this glazing by itself because it's not thermally sufficient. And it's also not very good structural glazing. Uh, we should add more layers of glazing, an outer layer to protect it from wind, rain, and snow, and an inner layer to protect from dust and to improve the overall thermal resistance. That gives us two still air layers because it's effectively triple glazed. If we la add low A coating to one of the layers in arg argon gas to suppress convection, we should be able to get the thermal resistance up to up to about R5. If we add more low E coatings, we can do even better. Adding these two layers of glazing and the low E coating will reduce the overall transmissivity by about a factor of 0.76. So if we go run our numbers again, um, before we got a transmissivity to diffuse skylight of 46%, we take this 76% additional reduction 
So we multiply, that's associated with these two additional layers of glazing that we added for protection and thermal benefit. We multiply 0 0.76 times 0 0.463, and we end up with an overall transmissivity of the entire assembly of 35.2. This is the transmissivity to the diffuse skylight, which is what we're taking as our primary source for illumination because the beam sunlight comes and goes and we can't rely on it. So <clears throat> this was the luminous value that we got for the glazing system before we added those two layers. So now if we add those two layers, we're going to multiply 0 0.76 times that. And it says that just beneath that glazing, we're getting about 5,000 lux. Now, this is much more than we would normally need in any space. A more common target illuminance in a space is 500 lux. So it, we can actually use that information, the ratio of these two numbers, to calculate the aperture area to floor ratio, which ends up being about this number divided by that, which is 0 0.10. But just to make sure you understand the mathematics of that, I'll walk you through it. If I take the target aperture area, which we need to calculate, and we describe, just divide that by the full bay aperture area, because that's what our experiment was dealing with. We had glass everywhere, so it was a full bay aperture area. If we take the target aperture area and divide by the full bay aperture area, that will be the target luminance near the floor level divided by the luminance near the floor level for the full bay aperture area. So we can multiply both sides of the equation by a full bay aperture area, which brings that factor over to the right side of the equation. Um, this ratio of target illuminance, this should say, uh, and this should say illuminance near the floor area. I apologize for misstating that. Um, <clears throat> so that ratio is 500 over 5,005. And we're going to leave the full bay as it is because we're just interested in defining an aperture ratio in this case. And it turns out 500 or over 5,005 is about 0 0.01. Or in other words, the target aperture area is about 10% of the full bay area. So this is what that looks like as a simple horizontal diagram where this might be a bay of the building and this is the circular aperture which represents 10% of that bay area. So we'd like to optimize this system in terms of a bunch of design trade-offs. So the roof needs to be deep enough to be structurally efficient. We need to achieve the target uh, illuminance human uniformity. A deeper roof structure means that the glazing will be mounted higher above the floor, which allows the admitted light to distribute more evenly. So both of these first two criteria suggest we want to articulate the roof in a fairly strong way. A deeper roof structure means higher structural efficiency a deeper roof structure can also lead to more uniformity in the illuminance. Uh, in, in contrast to that, we'd like to have low thermal envelope surface area. So we don't want to articulate this so deeply that the surface area of the roof increases dramatically because we want to keep the cost of the roof surface down and we also want to keep the heat losses through the roof low. And in this process, of course, we should never forget uh, spatial aesthetics. That should always be in the forefront of the th our thinking as we optimize the shape. So just to sort of give this some kind of visual and aesthetic frame of reference, the Pantheon sh shown here has achieved all the design goals that we articulated except the one having to do with thermal envelope area. It is, very, it is a very efficient structural form, so we've satisfied this criterion. It achieves very uniform illuminance and excellent light quality. It has wonderful spatial aesthetics. The only way in which it may not measure up to the design criteria that we have set is that it has more surface area than we would like for 
maximum thermal performance. So this image represents one design manifestation of this set of design goals. This involves a repetition of a domical geometry having a square boundary. So this is the boundary. And a circular opening at the zenith. This could be a concourse building with a central volume illuminated by a single aperture. The dimension of the central volume would be roughly 45 meters by 45 meters or roughly 150 feet by 150 feet. The wings of the building are shown as assemblages of smaller versions of that domical geometry with each element being roughly 15 meters by 15 meters. It looks pretty complicated. However, I collaborated with a firm that designed, fabricated, and sold network domes. They were able to assemble a 200-foot diameter dome in one day with three unskilled laborers, one slightly trained person, and scaffolding. No cranes or heavy equipment were required. The large central bay of, this, of the structure shown is similar in scale and complexity to those domes, which means with proper design and planning, the structure of the central bay could be very economical to fabricate and erect. With proper openings in this specialized glazing, this tracking daylighting system has the potential to be an extraordinarily accurate and instructive solar clock. I'd like for you to imagine this large central space with its beautiful finishes, light airy quality and polished brass elements embedded in the terrazzo floor, serving to amuse and educate huge numbers of visitors to this airport about the intricacies and wonders of solar motion. I would like to thank Kurt Fentress for making this symposium possible. It is a truly wonderful experience for so many visionary and optimistic people to have the opportunity to come together to share ideas in such an exquisite place.